In the city of Dublin in eastern 1916, a group of Irish rebels attempted to set an example of defiance and rebellion against the British authorities that would result in a general rising in Ireland. Britain was otherwise occupied with the First World War, so the assumption was that they wouldn't have the means to put down a rebellion in Ireland, which was then part of the United Kingdom. Well, the rebels actually understood from the get-go that their enterprise was more or less doomed. Um, and one of the more interesting little anecdotes about the Rising was um, Padraig Pierce, who was one of the leaders of the Rising, was asked by one of his men as before they started, do you actually think that uh, we have a chance of pulling this off? And Padraig was... Uh, supposed to have answered him with a great big hearty laugh. <laughs> of course we don't. None whatsoever. In other words, this is a doomed endeavor and isn't that funny? Well, okay. Um, a lot of people have heard anecdotes like that about the Irish reaction to uh, potential catastrophe and overwhelming odds. Uh, and a lot of people refer to that as evidence that the Irish are kind of... Uh, got a problem up here because they don't react to things normally. Well, uh, black humor is actually a defense mechanism that I think that a lot of oppressed people or people that have had rough lives develop um, to deal with the fact that uh, they seem to have more than their fair share of calamities and catastrophes. Um, even the Holocaust and Adolf Hitler have not been able to put even the slightest dent in the Jewish love of black humor. Um, it's uh, still notorious and world-leading, this sense uh, of uh, Jewish love or almost need uh, of self-deprecation, of ridiculing themselves and poking holes in whatever they attempt to do. Uh, Jewish people just seem to love this, and the world laughs along with them. Um, the, uh, in the same year, 1916, um, the First World War, as I mentioned, was going on, and one of the most cataclysmic battles of all time, possibly the most cataclysmic battle of all time, certainly the biggest up to that date, was taking place uh, in uh, eastern France. The Germans had decided in a rather crazy and heartless sort of deadly logic, black logic, that what they were going to do, since they couldn't defeat the French in an actual regular battle where you try and capture the enemy's positions, break through his lines or whatever, the best thing to do was to kill off the entire French army. Uh, so the, gen the, the Minister of War, uh, the German Minister of War, von Falkenhayn, said that, okay, if we attack the French in this sector, they'll have to commit so many of their soldiers into this vulnerable part of France, Verdun, uh, that... Um, will simply bleed the French army white. They will kill off their whole army. The, <laughs> he miscalculated a little bit because he thought that the French would conveniently just march in and let themselves all get mown down en masse when they conducted their suicidally brave defense against the German onslaught against this part of France that had such huge symbolic importance for the French people. Uh, the French fought, fought back hard and they were killed by the tens of thousands, um, but they fought back intelligently and cleverly, and they anticipated a lot of the German moves. And what happened was the uh, the Germans ended up uh, having pretty much the same ratio of casualties to combatants as the French did. Sure, the French managed to get pretty close to bleeding the French army white, but they came pretty darn close to bleeding their own army white as well. It was a phenomenal blunder in German military thinking. Uh, almost psychotic sort of blunder where um, the logic of something can fail so horribly. Um, there's not a great deal to laugh about when it comes to Verdun, although I bet there was plenty of, um, of dark humor. The French infantrymen, uh, the poilu, the, the sort of despised and neglected and ignored grunt of the French army, army was notorious for his... Uh, for his uh, black sense of humor. But as that battle developed, and it took place over a period of months, there took place another development in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, I believe. Um, 
a bunch of artists, mostly German, interestingly, mostly German, but also French and uh, uh, Spanish and Romanian and other uh, nationalities gathered, and they began an art form which in some ways uh, is still with us today and is in many ways the um, progenitor of pretty much all modern off-the-wall kind of art. It was called Dada. It was a completely crazy art form that made no sense whatsoever, and it was deliberately nonsensical. They were sort of saying, okay, in this cafe in Zurich, we're coming up with some pretty crazy plays, some absurd comedies um, about just totally nonsensical things, and it makes no sense whatsoever. We're doing this in, on a stage in a cafe in Zurich. Look what's going on over there in that titanic battle of Verdun. It was crazy. We're laughing at the life, uh, at life universe and everything because look what's happening over there. What, what are we supposed to do about this, about this insanity called life when things like that happen? We can sit down and we can start crying in despair, or we can just say, oh, isn't that crazy? Um, I mentioned the Foreign Legion in another, uh, another video. Uh, the Foreign Legion um, was also known for its totally insane, uh, the totally insane situations, Kafkaesque situations that they were put into. Um, the situation is hopeless, we have no chance of winning, and it's a suicide mission. Send in the Legion. And, of course, the, uh, the uh, foreign legionnaires understood that they were going to be used that way. Um, because, well, when you join the foreign legion, there's a big sign on the wall. Vous êtes soldat pour mourir, et je vous envoie où l'on meurt. Your soldiers, in order to be killed, you will be used for that purpose. It literally said that on the wall. In the, in the, and it, for all I know, it may still say that on the wall at legion recruiting centers. Um, and so they had this... Uh, this uh, mantra or this uh, motto: Vive la mort, vive la guerre, vive le sacre mercenaire. Long live war, long live death. Or sorry, long live death, long live war, long live the damned or cursed mercenary. Uh, the legionnaires were pretty much mercenaries and still are. Um, black humor, um, very black humor, gallows humor. Um, because when you're faced with something absolutely catastrophic or insurmountable, you've got, you still have some choices. You have the choice of how you're going to react to it. You can say, okay, I'm up against something that is absolutely insurmountable, so I think the best thing to do is to despair, is to collapse under the weight of it, uh, to just sort of say, okay, this is just something I can't deal with. I might as well just give up. Why not just laugh? I'm serious when I say this. Um, when Patrick Pierce went into his suicide mission in, in uh, Dublin in 1916, in the Easter Rising, should he have just said, oh yeah, we're screwed. Oh, well, we give it our best shot, whatever. Yeah, I'm probably going to end up on the gallows, whatever. Yeah, who cares? He, he did end up in front of a firing squad, actually. Or just say, okay, well, the situation is plainly hopeless. Whee! Isn't that fun? I don't think that that's a crazy attitude to take, and I think that at the end of the day, all humor is gallows humor. It all is. Whenever you laugh at something or somebody or some situation or whatever, you're laughing at someone's suffering. You're laughing at someone, uh, someone's inadequacies or someone, uh, someone else's mis misfortune. That's what humor is. And humor is something that I found would get me right out of uh, depression. It was probably the quickest, uh, most effective uh, means that I latched onto of dealing with it. Humor, and especially dark humor, where, yep, up against uh, an impossible situation. Ha 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 ha. I have a friend who is uh, of the same, who has had the same experiences that I have, and we often do share stories. Weren't we like nuts when we were like that? Like, can you imagine? You can't even pour yourself a glass of milk in the morning. Oh, yeah, you know, and you lay down on the couch like, ah, you know. It's a strange kind of gallows humor that I have developed concerning that sort of thing. I only apply it to myself because depression isn't funny for anyone else. But it is 
ultimately the subject of gallows humor, if you ask me, because, again, humor is always gallows humor, and the best things to ridicule are things that really aren't all that funny. Um, and this is why I think that things like antinatalism, which take the potential hopelessness of, of existence, which I don't necessarily dispute, um, life may be a complete and total dead end, um, and, and they sort of seem to deliberately exacerbate that sense of futility, that sense of suffering, that sense of negativity and nihilism, um, almost relentlessly. The only thing, the only escape from this is to annihilate ourselves. Um, I don't think that's a healthy way of reacting to life's difficulties. I think it's a lot healthier to get a good laugh out of it. I'm not saying that that's an easy skill to develop, but it's a valuable skill nonetheless. Um, laugh in the face of adversity. It's far more intelligent than one might think. It's certainly far more intelligent than a lot of the philosophies um, that deal with adversity that say, don't laugh. <laughs> Thank you.